bed Just like the leftovers you just said to leave everlasting life I don't go to anyone Cause I won't go alone Well, it's been quite a little deal getting <laughs> trying to get down here to the Copper Globe Mine. The road has been a little dicey. It's not that bad, but I mean, it's, it's a couple places it's probably about all I'd want to do. <laughs> anyway. It's beautiful country out here, I'll tell you. Road's a little rough in places getting here, but it's a pretty freaking nice view. shortly after seven and I noticed it was a little a little misty it's trying to rain I thought well maybe I better get a get up and get a fire going in case it rains a little not likely to do too much out here, but there is a 20% chance today, so could happen. Could happen. It's easier to start a fire before the rain than after it is raining, so that well, let's get her going then. So there's my piece of fat wood that is not very big that is just a sliver but i don't know hopefully it's enough well if it isn't i gotta get out of a little breeze here i really like this stuff i got because it 
It has so much resin in it. Where will I put this? Oh, <laughs> they scraped the flame off. It'll come back easy. I was trying to put it under that stick. Let's put it in there like that. And then... I don't have to be too particular, but I got to get a little. There's got to be a little wood in the flame somewhere, so I'll arrange a little bit here. Shouldn't take too much. You notice really none of these, really none of these sticks are really particularly small. <laughs> so. That little fatwood stick is pretty skimpy though. So I don't know. It may not, there may not be enough fatwood there to burn long enough to start anything, but we'll see. If it does, it'll be good. If not, I'll light another one. I got plenty. Well, it's uh, 38 degrees. So it's warmed up a few degrees from last night. But, so there's my sleeping setup. Out here in the plain on a very very rough road getting in here <laughs> yeah if, if it rains at all I'm probably not getting out of here it's a little chilly being you know 38 and a little misty I need to throw a cover over here I guess I don't really want to take it down yet but my tensegrity hammock stand here so I don't have to hook to a tree or anything like that put it anywhere I want and this is a PSS LE extra wide poncho it's got an Osni blanket in there and a beast in the bottom I'm going to use the beast till we get out of you know temperatures in the 30s at night anyway hang my flashlight up here it's got a lantern mode so it's got a flashlight and lantern lights so I use that my ridge line took me about five minutes to set this thing up and I am good to go let's go check on the fire I have a I have a tendency to get involved in two or three things and I burn my food, I start a fire and let it go out because I go hiking somewhere. That's me. <laughs> I am a, I am a genuine multitasker that fails at everything I multitask at. <laughs> so what's the fire doing? Well, Well, the fire's, the fire has caught hold, so that little tiny twig of fatwood was plenty good to get all this started. So I'm happy about that. I'll throw a little more stuff in here to let it catch. I really wanted to stay in bed a little longer and I thought, well, you know, I really probably ought to get at least a fire going. And you see, I dug this fire pit with my shovel. What I often do with fire out somewhere like this, like there's no, I didn't see any fire pits anywhere, no camps anywhere. And this is kind of a sandy clay soil. So I thought, well, I'd just dig my fire pit, and then when I'm all done, when I pack up camp, I'll pull the dirt back over it and smooth it out and everything. So when I leave here, nobody will know I even had a fire. So that's kind of what I prefer in situations like this. Oh, let's see. 
put the clean canteen down in there, heat me some water, or some postum. Get something warm in my belly this morning. I'm not gonna run out of firewood. There's plenty of plenty of dead pieces of pinyon pine and juniper laying right in the hill right above me here. Well, the fire's going good now. <laughs> Feels good. It's not bad out here. Like I say, it's 38 degrees. And, uh, but with it being a little bit of a breeze and the air is misty, the windshield on my truck is covered with raindrops. So, makes it feel a little little more of a chill in the air. This hammock stand, this 10 degree hand hammock stand, I need to give it another name. That's hard to say, the tongue twister. Anyway, this stand with the ridge line means I'm already set up to throw a tarp over here, you know, at any time. So I'm going to go ahead and do it, but I'm going to do something a little preparatory before I do that. This stand, you see, it can fluctuate, it can float. The only thing that's really secure holding it up is the guy line on this end. The guy line on that end is only really there. I don't even really need it. Since I'm using it as a tarp, or using it to hold a tarp, I don't want this uh, ridge line to be able to come to be loose. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to tighten this end so that it pulls up on that end. You'll, I'll show you. I got a a, little, a shock cord down there because I want this to stay fairly rigid. And to be honest with you, I don't know. I don't know why they float these things. To be honest. Um, I don't know why this couldn't be, I don't know why this stand couldn't be made up to where you're rigid on both ends. See this elastic, this is a shock cord out of my, this is what comes with all of our tarps. You get a set of three shock cords. So I just put that on there and cinch the, there's a cord lock on it. And I just cinch that down to the, to whatever degree I wanted. Oh, I pulled that out of there. Anyway. So, let's see here. There we go. So, see, this is the Dyneema cord. And if, if I get positioned a little differently in the hammock, it has the ability to pull all the way tight and keep it from going any farther than that so i'm going to just i'm just going to adjust the other end so it holds it tight like this all the time that way that'll give me a solid ridge line i mean it would stay fairly solid anyway but so what I've got on my ends here, this is just a whoopee sling. And so what I'm going to do is just pull up on that whoopee sling here. Like pulling it about all the way up. That way that gives me a solid ridge line to throw a tarp over. So now my ridge line is solid, and uh, I don't know that I'm going to stake this tarp out even at all. I just don't want to put this away because I may want to take a nap sometime or whatever today. I just don't want all this. There are some little rain droplets on it already from 
the mist in the air, the little. So this is a, one of our PSTL punch or tarps. This particular one is one of my oldest ones. This thing is probably, this thing is probably eight years old or so, I would imagine. It has been through the ringer. And this, uh, it's a PSTL, so it's 10 feet by 10 feet. So, what I want to do is just, uh, Throw this over the ridge line here. I'm probably going to have to stake it down a little bit because the breeze the breeze keeps wanting to carry it a little bit but but you can see that without virtually no trouble at all I could throw this 10 by 10 over or I could use our eight and a half by eight and a half do it diagonal I could throw it right over this whole setup and bam, I'm good for uh, having a cover over my sleeping. So I think I will. Yeah, you see the breeze. I wouldn't be surprised if we actually do get some rain today. <laughs> so you see on the back, here it is just free hanging, just draped over. I think what I'm going to do is uh, actually is I think I'm going to find me a stick here. I think I'm going to stake this about like so, about crotch high, and then stake down the corners. Now that side I'll find me a stick up here somewhere maybe head height and stake that one up. So I'll have, you know, just like a little more of an open look to it all looks like I need to wash my table off from last night I just went to bed I'm not kidding so I got some post them here and uh, 16 ounce cup and I want about two heaping spoons the way I do it now I just take some sugar here I just keep reusing the sugar thing I fill it back up when it gets empty from a big bag and then what I this is how I gauge how much sugar I put in there I just lightly sprinkle enough in there till it covers till it covers the postum like that, now I'm ready. <laughs> In just the brief time I was away putting the tarp over the putting the tarp over the hammock. This thing not only came to a boil, it boiled off this much water already. <laughs> Alright, let's see here. So here we go. I have to pour it tall like this. And I've learned to wear a glove when I do it because I burn my hand all the time. Kind of foams it up when you do it like this. All right, that's good. Now I'm going to put some more water in this and put it there by the fire so I'm ready for another one if I want it. So, there we go right there. Stir it up. Ah, it's going to taste pretty good. I put a little milk in it usually too. 
just a little bit. Well, I can't say I'm having a cup of joe, because that means a cup of coffee. <laughs> but, uh, something hot to drink. My cardiologist told me I cannot have caffeine. Caffeine is not, ac ac caffeine is actually not good for your heart. It messes with the, uh, it messes with your heart rhythm. And, uh, mine, mine got off a little, so I had to have a, that fixed. And my cardiologist said, no caffeine, none, zero. He's trying to make sure I got the point. None. <laughs> So, you know, and maybe that's a reason they're so, maybe that's a reason there's so much um, heart problems in the world, you know. I mean, that's a really common problem is heart problems. And you think about it, all the soft drinks, the energy drinks, the coffee, the different things. They're all loaded up with caffeine in them. I never really thought about it that much, actually. And then when my cardiologist was telling me, because basically caffeine kind of like a stimulant. It kind of, you know, just has the effect of changing things up a little bit. And, you know, you get... And maybe some people are more susceptible than others. I don't know. But that's one thing nice about the postum. Gives me a you know a decent hot drink. Got no caffeine, no preservatives, no. There's nothing artificial, no nothing in it. It's just roasted grain, molasses, whatever. So then I add just a not even a not even a teaspoon of sugar oh that tastes good it's just chilly enough with the breeze kind of that misty breeze it's just enough and it's just kind of a little chilly so the fire feels good i gotta throw some more wood on there and uh then this hot cup here is awfully nice Sometimes you just want to have something hot going down, you know, it just feels good. Okay, I've got to grab some more firewood here. So all up through here on this hillside is, is uh, you know, there's just chunks of debris of trees that have died and branches that have fallen off or whatever. And uh, everything up here is either pinyon pine. That's where we get uh, some really nice uh, pine nuts and stuff in the fall. And uh, junipers. So see, there's a whole dead tree of pinyon over there. <laughs> like maybe I'll just go over there and get some of that. And... The nice thing is the stuff here laying is already broken up. So, and I made, I dug kind of an oval fire pit. So I don't, I can just throw this kind of stuff in there without cutting it or anything like that. That's how we do it, right there. Haul this back and throw it on the fire. All right. 
So, you know, it's a it's a constant deal to keep the fire going, you know. Got to keep refreshing it all the time. But, you know, whenever the wet weather could turn rainy or something. I mean, if you want to have a fire, it's just so much easier to get one going ahead of time. And, and then it's pretty easy to keep it going even even in a moderate rain it's not that hard to keep a fire going if it's already going but if you need to start one it's a lot tougher and oftentimes it's not even worth doing at that point okay that should do me while I finish uh, Securing my tarp All right Welcome to my mess So in this drawer right here, I've got some Assortment of tent stakes need one two three four five six stakes There we are and I put shock cords in them, typically. Then we're gonna need two guy lines. Right. Our tent stakes all come, or our, our tarps all come with stakes like these. And I've got a, I've got a set of them, but. This tarp I've had out where I've used it for a number of other things. And uh, yeah, I don't need this, but it, it's handy. It's on top. Anyway, I've had this tarp out where I've used it, not really in tarp mode. <laughs> so I didn't put my stakes back with it. <laughs> That's me. Man, it's a little chilly with that breeze. All right, so what I do, here's our tarps all come with a set of three of these shock cords. They got a cord lock on one end so you can adjust them. So I'm just going to put a little stick through there as a toggle. Then I'll take this other end right here and I'm just going to hook it over little hook right here that my everything's hanging from and I can adjust that however I need to now I'll do the same thing on the other end all right here we go and I can do the toggle either through the strap or through the shock cord doesn't matter however and see I just bring this up in fact, actually, I'm going to kind of, there we go, there we go, I just hooked it in there. Now I can take this cord lock here, and I can slide it down a little, and I can tighten it more or adjust it if I need to, but that right there is good. I like to use a shock cord when I can because it gives me a little, you know, when the wind blows, things sway around. It just always keeps tension on there, so I just like it. Okay. I found me a piece of juniper here. Branch. So I'll just tie that little Swedish hitch. Oops. Right there it gives me kind of a sliding adjustment here and then tightening that down over top of my tie out point also helps hold that to stay on
Now you can come in here and do my taut line. A stake on in there. The ground seems kind of soft, but it's pretty it's pretty firm when you drive a stake in. Alright, so there's that. Now I will just tie these corners down a little bit and we'll be good. Alright, for tying out the corners, for tying out the corners, I'm gonna use I have an ultralight tarp accessory kit. And this is really not quite appropriate. <laughs> it's made to go on a shock cord on our ultralight tarps. So it's got this is <coughs> excuse me. This is from Dutchware. And uh I can't even remember what it's called. <laughs> I should know. I should know. We've done, sold hundreds of these things. Anyway, a little hook goes over a piece of shock cord on our ultralight tarps, but I'm just going to hook it on the tab like that. I really like this deal. Grounded. Like I say, it seems like it's really soft, but they shouldn't really do this. Tell you, Ben Tent stakes. But. but anyway, I just do like that, and then I put just like a one single half hitch over that little guy. That holds it. All right, there's the back end. Well, I found me a stick. I really wanted something a little longer. But a lot of times, a lot of times I like to get this one side, like maybe a little higher like this. But it's not happening today. So I'll tie this. I'll guy this out, and then I'll do the corners. Okay, I usually wrap my twine up in a or my cord in a figure eight, so all right, so the way I do this Swedish hitch thing, I just learned most people they go around their hand, their fingers. But I just learned to do it with two fingers because for For parachute cord and small cord, why that's really all you need. Now I'm secure. And that knot is a lot better than a lot of people give it credit for. I've actually hung my hammock up with that knot. And it holds my whole body weight, no problem. So it will do a lot better than people. A lot of times people trash on knots. Or crash, trash, crash on, trash on. Different knots. Oh, that knot's junk or whatever. But, you know, if you tie it, if you tie it right, tie it good. They do a lot better than we often give them credit for. All right, so now I'm going to come down here. Now we're going to do a taut line. One thing I like to do where I've got my cord already in that figure eight. I already got the cord in that figure eight loop. I just try to pull it out of there without undoing it all the way while I'm tying my knots. Whoops, there we go. There we go. Okay. So now I'm good. So kind of what I like to have is this be flat up here. Or down a little bit or up a little bit. 
I, well, I don't prefer it to be flat so much because when you pull the corners out, I'll have to pull these out a good ways, but a lot of times when you pull the corners out, what it does is when it starts raining, sometimes it'll want to settle here and it'll create a puddle. So I'm not going to worry about it now. If it really got raining and started doing that, then I'd adjust this thing up or down. Well, I can't adjust it up. I'll adjust it down. But anyway, and I usually like this if I'm doing my hammock like this. Like I do this between trees as well as with the... This is just kind of the first times messing around with a hammock over the Tensgritty hammock stand. So, anyway, but a lot of times I like to have this a little higher. In fact, I usually like to have my ridge line, you know, up about like this as well. So I'm just kind of messing around with, if I just use the stand as it is, throw the thing over. You know, I could make some extensions on that would raise it up more higher if I wanted to. But I just want to see if this will work like this. I have a couple, I have a number of shock cord loops like this. These are what goes through our tent stakes when we sell them. So what you do is just go like that. It's basically a square knot now. <laughs> so now this makes these little, this makes, this is what those little ultralight, uh, I can't what they call them, fleas? I don't know. Anyway, <laughs> they hook on. They're made to hook on the shock cord, so that's what I'm going to show you now. <clears throat> now Dutch wears. They make these guys for a smaller shock cord that I'm using. <clears throat> I like to use this eighth inch shock cord, and uh, so there's a little. There's a little uh, lip, a little indention right there on the hook side. Used to be bigger. I, I, I put these things in a pair of ice grips and I just hit it just with the belt sander just a little. And I take that down just a hair. It'll work without doing that, but it's a little more awkward getting it undone. So I still left some... See, it clicks just slightly when it goes on there. Now, now it won't come off. And the nice thing about this see, is now I have, I have shock cording on my corner to adapt to the wind. And one thing I like about these is I can, I hook that to my tarp first, and then I come down and put it in the ground. Don't put stakes in like that, but that's where you damage them. Okay, so you see that little end on there? It's got a little bit of a bulb on the end, so it's harder for me to do this and show you on camera than just to do it. But if you just give the cord just a little twist, this is Dyneema, eighth inch Dyneema. You just give it a little twist so it makes a loop what it what it really is is it's just a single half hitch i'm good that's all i gotta do i love it all right so so right here there's my 10 by 10 tarp or we call it a pstl 10 by 10 tarp it's got 27 tie out points comes with uh five 20 foot hanks of parachute cord comes with six abs tent stakes comes with set of three shock cords that I'm using to hold this thing tension. Anyway, so I've set that up over my Tensgritty hammock stand and it, you can see it works nice. And I like it, it's nice and reasonably taut. And let's get that shot right there. And so there's my hammock. I, I've got plenty of headroom, plenty of room in there for that to work nicely.
So, <clears throat> so anyway, I raised up this side just a little bit. I just didn't want to stake it to the ground. I'm, I'm not, I wasn't worried about keeping all the weather out in particular. I just wanted to, yeah, it was trying to rain, but see the sun's starting to peak out here. And when I look back over here, that, where is it? <laughs> that mountain right there, the base of that is the Copper Globe Copper Mine. I'm going to be showing you that as I go explore that today in a little while. You can see the skies are starting to clear. So I just finished getting ready for the rain. And now the clouds are going to burn off and it'll be sunshine. <laughs> I would rather have sunshine anyway. Be a little warmer. And out here, this is clay. The soil is sandy clay soil. So you get a little bit of rain on there. It is a mucky mess. Well, I was trying to think about what to uh, have for breakfast. I don't know what time it is, 10.30 or something. <laughs> I even got up early earlier today and I'm still having breakfast late, but it's all right. I've hiked all over creation and stuff. Anyway, yes, I'm gonna think I'm gonna have a steak, quesadilla type thing. I've got some tortillas. I've got some pepper jack cheese. I've got, got plenty of bacon, but I don't think I'll. I might put a little on there, I don't know. I've got some mushrooms, I could put those on there. What else? And I've got a got some steak. I'll probably just cut this. I mean, half would be more than enough. And I don't know. Maybe I'll put one egg. Let's just see what happens. So I decided to start with some bacon. I've got plenty of it. I'll probably snack on some while I'm cooking. How's that? Sounds like a good plan to me. And that'll get my pan all lubed up and everything. I threw a few mushrooms in there. I really, for a quesadilla, I'm not going to need that much meat. So, I'll just kind of do like that. And I'll use, save the rest for later. Got a little post them here. Dump a little bit of that in there for a little extra moisture and flavor. Perry's unconventional cooking. We're talking about here.
I got onion. I should have put some onion in here. Oh well. All right. That looks pretty good. The stuff got caramelized in there. Mushrooms and post them and bacon. And they get caramelized. I like to heat it on one side and then flip it over. All right, nice and juicy. Heck, that's what fingers are for, man. That's going to be good. I had more meat than I need, man. Might have to have two of these. There we go. Now, as than that, this probably got too hot. No, it's all right. So then I like to tear my cheese in half and kind of stagger it like that. We'll load it up with meat, I think. What the heck? You only live once or twice. We'll load it down with some onions, or uh, onions, mushrooms. Throw on a little bacon, and then melt the cheese down. Might have left it too long. Nah, nope. It's about right. Want it to brown just a little bit. The cheese is melted down in there. Cheese and steak, mushrooms, and bacon. Bacon's just there for seasoning. Things juicy, it's gripping. Mm. Meat, cheese, bacon, and mushrooms. I love it. This will give me some energy for the day right here. I've been needing this. So if I'm sitting in here, this setup just using the ridge line that's just using the ridge line that's with the, uh, that I'm using with the hammock stand. You know, I'm kind of, I'm kind of close, but it's, it would be doable. But, you know. As far as laying in here, you know, I'm good. I got nothing like right against me. 
Uh, I got plenty of space up here. I can have my I can have my little mini micro lantern in here. And I'm I'm pretty good to go. Now I kind of like it cuz I don't really if possible, I don't like to be closed in. So here's this little cabin here. Got a stove. With the metal barrel top as a lid, so build your fire right there. This becomes the hot plate. Smoke goes up the chimney. Right there. There it is. Pretty simple. Well, this is the remains of some building. I don't know which one this was, what it was. Anyway, laying stone. <laughs> I think this blue and greenish stone right here is what they were looking for. I think that's what had the copper content in it. There's a lot of that greenish stone, a lot of green, some blue in it. I believe that's the copper bearing stone. Well, this is some interesting formation here. This sandstone, it looks like it's sandstone. I wonder if it has some limestone mixed in or whatever. But instead of weathering smooth, it's weathered very jagged. Now they had a shaft that went down through here that they bored to the solid rock. I don't know how deep it was originally. It's either back filled from erosion or maybe it was blown. Maybe they blew it up. I don't know. Something. <laughs> I just found another shaft. All these are all these are considered dangerous and so they've they've put bars in here welded or shut anyway so there's that it goes down there and turns to the left so there's well if I start what I seen today one shaft over there, going straight down to the rock. This one here into the wall. All right, here's another opening down here. I don't know how they kept water out of here. This is a little bit wider shaft, I think, than that last one. Should have brought me a flashlight. I don't know how far that goes in there. So it looks like it's probably filling up with sand. Maybe what they're seeing is this stuff right here. And that vein goes back in there. And it looks like there might be some more of it down in those lower layers. So oh, here's the opening of another mine shaft. We'll go around and look at it. So there's another shaft in here. <laughs> look at this. Look at the winch they made. Just out of some pipe. 
and steel cable. <laughs> they were making do, man. So now I've come around the edge of the mountain here. It's not very far, but just around and to the south. Explored a little stuff up here, so I already know there's some stuff up here. All right, so here's that building, a shed, or something. I don't know what it was for. I'm thinking it was maybe a utility shed or something. Looks like maybe they had they had pigeons in. Here. I don't know what they had in here something maybe they use carrier pigeons <laughs> anyway it's just a bunch of junk now but at one time it had a purpose now it could be that because of this shaft right here behind there you know maybe Maybe that was it. Maybe this, maybe that building there serviced this mine shaft here. Well, yes, of course I'm going to go under the fence. I got to look down in there. So they've welded the rebar on here. And I don't know how far down that goes. I don't know if it cuts back in on one side or not. Who knows? All I know is it echoes. <laughs> now just up from the mine there, up this way is the living quarters, a cabin. And uh, so you can get an idea of that. Then we can go in here. Well, we had some bunk beds, several beds here. I wouldn't want to sleep on one right now. <laughs> anyway, but there's the quarters. They built them a little fireplace here. Even had a mirror on the wall. So they could pretty up before going in the mine. There's <laughs> something. But anyway, there it is. Even look at this. That right there is luxury. Even got a paper towel holder. You got windows with curtains. Imagine that. I mean, this is highfalutin mining right here, let me tell you. A little bit up from here, there's a couple remains of a couple other little buildings or something, and I have no idea what they are. One of them, I think, might have been an outhouse or something, but I don't know. Now, down on the bottom of here, so there's our mine shaft. So that's number five. That's the fifth one. They told me there was three. I've found five. Um, so that makes one, what, two, two vertical shafts and one and three horizontal. Now down here, somebody was laying stone and, uh, they're using mortar and everything. I didn't know what they were trying to do, but they had even... Anchored into the wall here. There's wire and then anchored into here to just kind of hold it, I guess. So I don't know. I don't know what they were building in here. Maybe another cabin or something. I don't know. There's the inside part of it. And you can see they even 
putting uh, mortar on the wall, covering the rock, smoothing it here. Now this might have been some later people that were not mining but came up here and trying to build something. And I do notice they have chiseled into the wall here and they had some boards in here. There and right here and right there. They had put boards in there and then cemented them. So maybe a roof came out from there or something. And it looks like there's some more piece of wall here that may have fallen down. So this may have gone on across here farther. And maybe they were just building a, a shelter into the wall of the thing or something. I don't know. I do notice up here there is a something here from 1993. I don't know if that's I don't know if that's whoever did it or not. That's my exploration of the copper globe. And it's interesting to me. I because I oh I see what I see, see what they did, try to see what they're looking for, try to look at how difficult what they were doing was. Oh, there is one more thing. There is a the smelter we got to show you, and the wood pile. So here's another mine shaft. And I don't know how far back that goes, a ways, but. Probably they're following this, I'm suspecting, this, this vein here. You can see it some on the front here. So this right here is a smelter that they had built. Um, it failed the first time because they built it out of the wrong kind of bricks instead of refactory bricks and they melted through. Then they redid it. And then they had a fire, and that's kind of it. So this wood pile right here is, uh, represents wood that they used to try to run the smelting operation. Um, it was too expensive to haul the raw ore out of here to, to uh, get it refined somewhere. So they were trying to save money by smelting it here. And then that way what they hauled in would be, I guess, more pure, more, more ready to go. <laughs> Not wasting money hauling a bunch of stuff that had, you know, not so much value. Well, so here's another cabin type place just up from the mines. This one's the biggest place, and it's the roof caved in, and everything's just kind of gone from there. There's a bunk bed there. There was one over there, fireplace there. A lot of the roof and some of the walls and stuff were tinned over with old cans, pounded flat and nailed down. So there's a chimney. They built up, and then you notice this metal <coughs> sheeting type stuff here. And the window is a, oh, there's a couple bed springs in there. But you notice the walls. One of the reasons this thing didn't last much is it wasn't built very strong. <laughs> oh, I got back to camp and I'm like, I just want to lay down. <laughs> so here I am living the life man living the life well I've been out and around and everywhere today hiking driving investigating exploring checking out the mines checking out the scenery checking out the roads I got back to camp and I'm like 
I need to lay down. So I just popped into my hammock here and took me a little brief snooze. Anyway, but see, I really like this uh, 10 by 10 tarp, and I'm going right on top of the ridge line uh, that's in place for the Tenzegrity hammock stand. So, really, my ridge line's done. I just throw a tarp over it and anchor the tarp out however it needs to be. I pulled up this side a little bit just to have a breeze, a little flow through. I got plenty of coverage anyway. And the other side over there, I lifted it up just a little bit higher. In reality, I would have rather in reality, I would have rather lifted that side a little bit more. That's my entry-exit side. But that's about the longest sort of straight stick I could find around here. So I just may do with it. <laughs> All right. As promised. Very back in the fire pit. Yes, I brought a rake. Makes it so much easier to do this. Here we are, ready to go. Well, I'm gonna head out over the rough road here. Most of the rough, rough sections I came through getting here, they were rough going down. Now I gotta climb them, so see what happens. <laughs> but, uh, get a little stormy out there in the direction I'm going so hopefully we're good <laughs> 